Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the session seven of genomic variant analysis and clinical interpretation. So, in this session, I will be talking about the introduction of the ACMG and AMP guidelines that would be used for interpretation of sequencing variant. So, what is ACMG and AMP? ACMG stands for American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and AMP stands for Association of Molecular Pathology. The, uh, these are the non-profit organization which are composed of clinician and geneticist who design these guidelines for the interpretation of the variants. So before going into deep what are these guidelines, let's understand about the human genome. So as you all know that the human body are made up of trillions of cells and each cell contains 23 pair of chromosomes. These 23 pair of chromosomes are made up of 3.3 billion base pairs. These 3.3 billion base pairs are encoded by adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which are the ATGC. If there's any change in this 3.3 billion base pair from the reference genome are known as variants. Every homo sapiens are differ from each other only by 1% of this change in the base pair. That's why we all look different from each other. So there are different types of variant. If we look closely to the uh, chromosome or the genome, we'll know there are different types of genes and each gene has the exons and introns. And the, the region between the genes is known as intergenic region. If there's any variant in the intergenic region, it is known as intergenic variant. If it is present at the entronic region, intronic variant. If it is at the exonic variant, exonic region, it should be present in the exonic region. As you all know that, that because of the exons, uh, exon may transcribed into RNA and further translate into the protein. So if there's any variant in the exonic region, it will also affect the protein folding as well as the amino acid, which are the, which this protein has been built up of. Okay, so let's uh, look at it. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, suppose there's a nucleotide. From a three nucleotide, it will code for a single amino acid. Like CAG will code for glutamine, ACC for proline, ACT for threonine. So there's any mutation or suppose like this in this at the sixth position there is a mutation from c to a but the change in the amino acid is uh, there's no change that is from proline to proline so such type of mutation are known as silent or synonymous mutation but at the fourth position when there's a change from a to t and there's a change in the amino acid from proline to histidine such type of mutation are known as a missense mutation or the non-synonymous mutation Suppose there is an addition or deletion of any nucleotide which has taken place. So that will change the whole frame of uh, the amino acids uh, to the downstream process. Like here, if you can see that instead of a proline, there is serine and downstream to a threonine, there is a histidine. So such type of mutation which the whole frame of uh, the protein has changed is known as frame shift mutation. But if there is an addition or deletion of the nucleotide which taken place in a multiple of three, then such type of mutation are known as non frame shift mutation. So in this, when there is an addition of GCT, there is the addition of the amino acid that is phenylalanine. Last is the stop chain mutation. If there is a mutation uh, variant which has been taken place at much earlier stage, uh, before the whole translation of uh, the protein, such type of uh, mutation will be known as stop chain mutation. Okay. Uh, next, how this variant has been uh, inherited uh, within a family. So if we can take an example of the father and the mother, which has the heterozygous variant, uh, both of them has a heterozygous variant that is capital A, and the child has, uh, uh, suppose child has inherited this wild type copy from the father as well as from the mother. So such type of genotype will be wild type with no variant present in it. Right? If the uh, child has inherited the, the copy, which has a variant, but it has inherited the, the wild type copy from the mother, then such type of genotype for the variant is known as heterozygous, in which there's only one variant on the one copy of the gene. Next, if it has inherited on both the copy of the gene, the variant from both the father and mother, such type of variant genotype will be homozygous, okay? Now let's talk, uh, talk about the compound heterozygous. Compound heterozygous is in respect of two variants. Like in this case, 
there's A, capital A, and capital B. But if both of them are on the same copy of the gene, then this compound heterozygous variant will be in cis. But if it is on the two different copy, that will be known as trans. So let's take an example in here. Uh, so for here, it is in father. It is present on the same copy of it. And the child also inherited the same copy of it from here. But in the mother, it is heterozygous variant, which is A. But it has inherited this wild type copy from the, uh, from the mother. So since both the variant which are present on the same copy of the gene, then we will call it as compound heterozygous in cis. Okay. Next, if uh, we forget about the mutation in this uh, father, that is capital A, there's only cap uh, capital B mutation uh, uh, variant is present in the father. And in the mother, capital A is present. If it has inherited this particular copy from the father and the A copy from the mother, then also it has both the uh, variant, but in the two different copy of the gene. So such type of compound heterozygous variant will be known as compound heterozygous in trans. Okay. Now let's see how uh, how the genotype uh, will affect and uh, there will be a disorder uh, that will take place. That is how the mode of inheritance of a variant will work. So if we look at it here, uh, I think you have already been gone through this uh, mode of inheritance uh, by Anjali in the previous uh, lectures. I'm just uh, going through some of uh, uh, <coughs> some of the type of uh, mode of inheritance. So let's start with the autosomal recessive. So as you know, then autosomal recessive mode of inheritance, uh, the uh, the genotype should be in the homozygous or trans compound heterozygous for the person to be affected or having a disorder. So in this case, as you can see that if there's a AA, capital A on both the her gene, on both the copy of the gene, then only the person will be affected. Otherwise, like in here, the mother and father, both are carrier for the variant, but won't manifest any of the mutation. And similarly, the sibling, which also is the carrier of the mutation, won't manifest any of the mutation. While there could be the possibility that this child has inherited both uh, the copies which does not have the variant. So it will be the wild type homozygous. Next is the autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. In this, if only a single copy of uh, uh, the gene having the mutation or a variant, then the person will having a disorder. This could be inherited from the affected mother which having a same heterozygous genotype. So in this way, it can be inherited from the mother to the son. Next is the X-linked recessive. In the X-linked recessive, as you can see that uh, female has a two copy of X chromosomes, while male has only one copy of X chromosome. So even though this one copy is affected, the female will be the carrier of it. But it could be inherited to the male child. Uh, if the defected copy has been inherited to the male child, he will be affected, while the Female child will be only the carrier for that particular disorder. And the last is the de novo inheritance. As you know that de novo is stand for a new mutation. So in here, as you can see that in the pedigree, in both the parents, there's no capital A mutation which is present. It has been the new mutation which has been arised in the germ cells of these parents that is known as capital A and small a, and which is causing the disorder. Such type of inheritance is known as de novo inheritance okay now let's look at it as i've already told you uh, our chromosomes are made up of multiple genes and this genes uh, will uh, transcribe into the rna and further translate into the protein so suppose in this uh, this is a normal gene there's no variant then it will be a healthy protein means protein has been folded perfectly and there won't be any disease but there could be the possibility when there's a variant is present even though the variant is present, you can see that it won't affect the functionality of the protein and uh, the person will be healthy. And the third scenario, there could be some of the uh, variant which could be uh, affect the protein functionality and the person will be diseased. Now we have to comprehend how this uh, variant is causing a disease and this variant is not causing a disease. So there are different methods by which you can analyze uh, variant pathogenicity. 
So different methods are, uh, we can use population database in which uh, a uh, large number of uh, healthy individual has been sequenced and we can find it out uh, from there whether our variant will be pathogenic or not. Second, we can use the functional studies uh, to validate whether the protein uh, uh, is malfunctioning or not <coughs> using the mouse model, zebrafish modeling and so on. Next, we use, uh, can use the computational tools to identify or validate the, these variants and case control studies like uh, genome-wide association studies and segregation data sets like uh, if the variant has been segregated within a family, whether it is causing a disorder or not. And the further, it's the annotated databases. We will go through each and every database in a great detail in the further slides. So these are the uh, some of the databases which can be used for the variant interpretation. So by using these variant interpretation methods, one can uh, classify variant into not disease causing or unknown, or it could be disease causing which will be in a technical terms uh, known as uh, for not disease causing it is benign, unknown it will be variant of uncertain or unknown significance and disease causing that is pathogenic. So from now we are going to use this terminology uh, to uh, signify, assign uh, the variant pathogenicity to our variants. Okay. So what are the limitation of this uh, variant interpretation? So uh, in variant interpretation, as you can see that uh, in here, for a same variant, different uh, clinicians or scientists have used a different methodology. For example, some of them have used uh, the population data sets and the segregation uh, methodology to interpret the variant. Some of them have used the functional studies to interpret the variant. And some other has used uh, annotated data sets or uh, biochemical studies uh, for the variant annotation. Since all of them have a different approach for the variant interpretation, so the outcome also will be different for them. For the same variant, different uh, clinicians or scientists has interpreted the variant as a variant of unknown significance or uncertain significance. Using the functional studies, they have interpreted the variant as a benign. And by using the biochemical studies and annotated database, uh, the third one has uh, <coughs> classified the variant as pathogenic. Since uh, uh, different methodology has been used, the so single variant have a multiple annotation. So it will be very difficult for anyone to comprehend whether this variant will be causing a disease or not. So how could we uh, bring everyone at the same place to identify the variant and classify at the same uh, position? So uh, if we can combine all these data set into one, and on the basis of it, we can classify the variant as a disease causing or not, then our problem can be solved. So by combining all these data sets, let us say population data set, computational methods, uh, functional data sets, well annotated databases, genome wide association studies, segregation data set, we combine all this, we can uh, classify our variant. And the same thing has been done by ACMG. They have combined all these data sets and put it in 28 standard guidelines, which are uh, <clears throat> basically are very stringent for the variant interpretation. And by using these 28 standard guidelines, they have been divided into five categories, this variant. That is pathogenic. Likely pathogenic means that 80% they are sure that the variant is uh, causing a disease. VUS is variant of uncertain significance and likely benign is a, uh, there's 80% chance the variant is not causing a disease and benign that the, it is a, not causing a disease. <laughs> so in this way, they have classified using the different data set and methods to classify our variants. So let's uh, give a small uh, summary about what is ACMG. ACMG is American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. And it's a working group which is composed of clinicians and uh, geneticists which put forth uh, the sequencing uh, variant interpretation guidelines in 2013. And these uh, guidelines are designed only for the variant for the Mendelian disorders. And uh, this ACMG board has put forth uh, the 59 clinically actionable genes, which, uh, which need to be, if uh, the sequencing has been done for an individual, it should be reported back to the patient or uh, the particular individuals. 
regardless of their age or the individual, it should be reported back. And it is the responsibility of the clinician to provide the comprehensive pre and post test counseling for that 59 genes. And these 28 guidelines have been formatted in the form of 28 attributes. That is, uh, as I've already told you, the solution of the variant interpretation, different uh, individual has interpreted the data and got the different uh, a result. There is a multiple variant annotation and using ACMG it could be divided into uh, uh, this particular variant can be classified as a pathogenic by ACMG. So what are the terminology of for the 28 attributes uh, that are representative of uh, 28 standard guidelines? So if you can look at it, uh, this uh, 28 attributes, they're divided into pathogenic and benign. Pathogenic standard has been denoted with B while benign has been denoted with B. This pathogenic are further different uh, categorized into on the depending on the guideline severity, like uh, very strong with VS, strong with S, moderate M, supporting with P. So, and similarly, the benign has been uh, denoted with A, that is very strong, as the strong supporting SP. So if there's only one guidelines for uh, uh, very strong, it will be reported as PVS1. But for the strong, as you can see that it is PS1 to 4. So there are four guidelines. That is PS1, PS2, PS3 and PS4. And furthermore, for the moderate, there are six guidelines. So from P PM1 to PM6 and supporting PP1 to PP5. So in this way, it has been uh, uh, attribute has uh, different terminologies. So now how these attributes had been distributed over different data sets. As I've already told you, this ACMG has uh, uh, classified the variant on the basis of uh, these uh, data sets, that is the population, computational methods, uh, variant type, uh, and so on. And for each of these uh, data set has uh, the associated attributes. For example, for population data set has uh, four of its attributes like BA1, BS1, BS2, PM2, and so on. And computational method have different uh, attributes, or you can say that they have different guidelines uh, for that particular uh, <coughs> uh, data sets, okay? And on the basis of uh, this, uh, uh, the variant has been classified as uh, uh, into these five categories. So suppose if we can take an example of one of uh, the RSID, this RS112532. So on the basis of uh, the data set, like in here, it's a population data set. So it will assign, if it can uh, satisfy some of the guidelines. So for example, it is satisfying the guidelines of PM2. So the PM2 will be ticked. And if it satisfies the computational method guideline for PP3, that will be ticked off for this particular variant. Similarly for variant type PM5, functional studies PS3, and for segregation data set, it's PS2. On combining all these attributes, these five attributes, this particular variant can be classified as pathogenic. In this way, this variant has been classified. So there are two methods by this uh, variant can be retrieved. Either it could be retrieved with the databases, like in here these uh, databases are present, or why we can screening the literature. So these four uh, uh, methods or databases can be screened from the literature. That is functional method, segregation data set, allelic data set, and genome-wide association studies, and so on. So as we know that, uh, ACMG classify the variant on the basis of the data set and the methodologies uh, like population data set, computational method and classify into these five categories. So in the further slide, uh, we will go through each and every data set and provide the overview how we can interpret the variant. We won't be going into much detail about these ACMG attributes that will be covered in the different lectures. Okay, so let's start with the population data sets. So, uh, before understanding what is a different type of population and how we can interpret the variant, let's look at the basic terminology that is widely used for population data sets. Uh, so let's take an example of 10 individuals in a population in which two individuals are homozygous for the variant, while three individuals are heterozygous, while other fives does not have a variant. So first start with the genotype count. So genotype count is the total number of individuals with the specific genotypes. So in this, the capital A, capital A 
are present in two of the individuals. So the genotype count for the capital A, capital L for this population will be two. While for the heterozygous mutation, it has been carried by the three individuals. So the genotype count for the capital A, small a will be three. While for the small a, small a, which does not have a variant, that is the reference uh, allele. So the genotype count for this will be five. That is there are five individuals which are present in this. Okay. Next, uh, we will look at the genotype frequency. Genotype frequency is the division of a genotype count with a total number of individuals. So for capital A, capital A, the total number of individuals with this genotype is two, which divided by total number of uh, individuals that is 10, which will provide us the genotype frequency of 0.2. While for the heterozygous, the total number of individuals with this genotype is three divided by 10 is 0.5. Similarly, for small a, small a, it is 0.5. Next is the allele count. So what is allele? Allele is the total number of variants uh, which are present at each chromosome in the population. So if we look for the capital A variant, uh, in which how many of these are present on the chromosomes? So if we just count the total number of alleles like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the allele count for the capital A will be seven, while for the small a, uh, it will be 30. If we just count it, it will come out as 30. Okay. Next is the allele number. Allele number as the homo sapiens are deployed. So we just multiply by the total number of pop, uh, individual which are present in a population into T2 and uh, it will give you the allele number. So 2 into 10 will provide you 20. And the allele frequency will be allele count divided by allele number. That is 7 divided by 20 which will provide you 0.35 and uh, small a 13 divided by 20 will provide you 0.65 okay next uh, 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 due to the reduction in the number of uh, uh, due to the reduction in the cost of the sequencing the number of individuals from different ancestry background has been sequenced and the various global and uh, population specific genomic sequencing project has been completed so if you can look at this figure in from 2005 to 2018, a large number of uh, global sequencing project as well as population sequencing project has been completed. For example, the HapMap project, the Thousand Genome project, Nomad, which are uh, known to be as a global uh, sequencing project is completed uh, within this short period of time. While also there are uh, population specific projects like Qatar, Canada, Tibet, which has been completed and provide the population architecture of that particular population. Also, it will provide you the allele frequency of that particular population that will help in the variant interpretation. Okay. So how does uh, this population genome database is work? So we have a healthy individuals and we perform the whole exome or whole genome sequencing by which we identify the common variant and the rare variants and calculate the allele frequencies for that particular population which has been distributed over the population or subpopulation level and uh, put in the these databases like uh, which are well known databases like uh, nomad thousand genome project and esp6500 okay so the global sequencing project or databases are thousand genome project nomad esp6500 which uh, in which uh, thousand genome project has 2504 individual which had underwent whole genome sequencing and they belong to the five major population that is Africa, America, East Asia, Europe, and South Asia. Okay. While NOMAD is the largest global sequencing project till date in which it encompasses of 76,156 individuals from 10 populations. Okay. In which the major population encompasses of a European and American ancestry. And then recently they have added the Middle Eastern population. While ESP6500 has 6,503 individuals from two population and majorly contributed by African American and European Americans. For Thousand Genome Project, it has 88 million variant which has been distributed all over the all over the, these uh, different populations. While Nomad has 659 million variant with their different allele frequency for all the major population while it's ESP6500 has 56 million variants. So depending on the, uh, uh, as you all know that the, these thousand genome nomad ESP6500 
uh, has been built for only on the healthy individuals. So depending on the, the allele frequency for this variant, we can interpret our variant. If the allele frequency is very high, that means that the variant is present in large number of the healthy individuals. That means that particular variant is not causing a disease. So the high allele frequency is an indication or it interprets the variant will be benign or not causing a disease. In this way, we can interpret using a population data set. Okay. So next, after the population data set, we have a computational method for the variant interpretation. So there are multiple algorithms that we can use for the variant interpretation based on the computational methods. So uh, if we can look at it for the shift, uh, some of the tool like shift and polyfan, which look at the variant pathog which predicts the variant pathogenicity based on the protein structure. How much the protein folding has been affected by the variant? While Pathum, that is functional analysis through hidden Markov model, works on the evolutionary conservation as well as the functionally important domain for the variant pathogenicity. While CAT, CAT used the machine learning algorithm as well as the multiple databases for the variant prediction and divide the variant either into the pathogenic, VUS, and benign. From there, we can identify whether this variant is causing a disease or not. Okay. Next, we'll go for the well annotated databases. In so based on the disease annotated database, we can also classify and interpret our variant of interest. So there are multiple clinicians and geneticists which interpret their data with the help of the patient's sequencing studies. So they either perform the computational analysis, biochemical assays, or population data sets. And on the basis of it, they submit it into a database. And the databases with the help of the expert opinion and lab concordance further divided into the three categories that is benign, VUS, and pathogenic. The, some of the well-known annotated uh, disease annotated databases are OMIM, that is Online Mendelian Inheritance in Men, PINVAR, and HGMD, that is Human Gene Mutation Database. These databases are keeps on getting updated on a regular basis. If we look at uh, some of the databases uh, uh, and their features, so for the o OMIM, that is Online Mendelian Inheritance in Men, it is a compendium of a human Mendelian genes and phenotype. It composed of 15,000 genes and with its a Mendelian disorder, and data is freely available upon request. While in Clinva, it's an archive of the human genetic variation with the clinical interpretation. There are more than six, seven, lack 60,000 genetic variants which are present and their clinical interpretation from different labs and variants can be freely downloadable. While in HGMD, that is Human Gene Mutation Database, it's an archive of the germline mutation which are associated with the inherited disorder, that is Mendelian disorder. It had more than two lakh variants from more than 8,000 genes which are manually curated from 2,600 journals. The public data is freely available for browsing. So in this way, if our variant is present in any of these disease annotated databases, we already know what will be the classification of that particular variant. So in this way, these disease annotated database could help in our variant classification and interpretation. So next is the variant depth. How the type of the variant will affect the protein structure? So as I've already gone through some of the type of the mutation and its effect on the protein structure. So if you look at this, this is the normal, uh, normal nucleotide, which uh, uh, codes for this amino acid, that is the glutamine, proline, and threonine. While the, the, some of the mutation like synonymous, intronic, and intergenic mutation won't have any effect on the protein structure because the synonymous mutation the change in the amino acid will be same. So the folding will be almost similar. <clears throat> While for the intronic and intergenic, they're not in the part for the formation of the protein. So there won't be any effect on the protein structure. So the impact uh, or the variant effect will be benign. It's not causing a disease according to the protein structure. Next, if we look at the non-synonymous and non-frameshift mutation, there will be in the non-synonymous, there is a change from proline to styrene. Also in the non-frameshift, there's an addition of one of the amino acid which can take place. 
since there is only a change at a single amino acid position the effect on the protein will be moderate and <clears throat> Yeah, uh, and the, if it's present in the functionally important side, that it could lead to the disease. But if it is not present at the important side, majorly it won't cause any disease. Other, uh, other like uh, frame shift mutation is stopping. Since the frame shift mutation will change the complete frame of the protein and will uh, change the protein structure as well as function, that's why this frame shift and stop gain mutation with a a high effect on the protein structure and could be considered as a pathogenic variation. So in this way, on the type of the variant, we can uh, classify the protein structure. So based on the type of the variant, we can uh, interpret our uh, variant of interest as uh, different type of variant have a different uh, effect on the protein structure. So next we will go for the functional methods. On the basis of the functional assay, we can uh, interpret our variant of interest whether that variant is causing a disease or not causing a disease based on the experimental evidence. So, uh, let's suppose there is a gene and there is a mutation. You think that because of this mutation, uh, that person is uh, suffering from the disorder. So, you can perform various assays like in vitro or in vivo assay. In vitro assay are those assays which are done on the conical flask or a test tubes, while in vivo assays are performed within a <coughs> mouse model or a zebra fish or a house fly. It could use um, uh, the samples like patient sample because patient sample you know there's a mutation is already present in it and you can perform various experiments like uh, you can quantify for the protein and you can check the protein functionality and so on. Otherwise you can uh, make the gene editing and can in <coughs> put the mutation of your interest in the gene or also you can uh, place your gene with the mutation in the plasmid and can be transfected into these model organisms. After transfection into this model organism, you can perform analysis such as protein or mRNA expression. So with the help of the mRNA expression, you can uh, uh, compare this with your wild type, that is a normal. And in this, you can see that on the x-axis, there's one wild type that is a normal protein and there are two which are mutant, which has a mutation. Now we will compare it with the wild type and in here is you can see that uh, the, for the mutant one, there's significant reduction which you can see in the protein or mRNA expression and due to which we can say that that mutant one is causing a disease and, <clears throat> and responsible for the disorder in this particular individual. While for the mutant two, if we check, it is very comparable with the wild type. That means that this particular mutant is not responsible for the disease and it will be not causing a particular disease, okay? So also the functional assay, there won't be a single assay for a single variant validation. There would be, for different disorder, there would be a different assay for the functional validation. So in this way, we can interpret our mutant. Next, we'll go for the segregation data. Whether the variant is segregated within a family is causing a disorder or not. So let's take an example. There's a mutation that is T27R, and there's a wild type WT. So in this, there's a family which is affected with the autosomal recessive mode of inheritance. So here, as you can see that uh, mother and father are heterozygous for the variant, while the person who inherited the variant has inherited both the affected copy from the father and mother and manifesting the phenotype. That means with the homozygous uh, <coughs> variant, it is showing the phenotype. That is variant is segregating with the phenotype. Also, you can see in the third generation, uh, when these two individuals which are heterozygous mate together and pass on the variants or the gene to the third generation, it is showing the homozygous and we're showing the phenotype in this also. So in this, we can say that variant segregate with the disorder, but not in the unaffected individual, only in the affected individual. So we can say that this particular variant is a segregated as causing a disease within a family. While if we take another example of A96V mutation and the wild type that is WT. So in here, as you can see that uh, uh, both mother and father are heterozygous for the variant, but while inheriting, this particular individual is manifesting the phenotype, but the mutation it does not have the mutation, it has a wild type. That means the variant is not segregating with the disorder. But in here you can see that this particular uh, individual 
is not having a phenotype or a disorder, but it has both the variant in a homozygous state. So also if you can see in the third generation, uh, the variant is not present in this particular individual and uh, it is showing the phenotype. While in this, it has a uh, variant, but it is not showing any phenotype. This means the variant is not segregating with the disorder while it is segregating with the affected, unaffected individual. So this particular variant, we can say that is not causing a disease, not responsible for the disorder. So based on our variant segregation studies, we can interpret the variant pathogenicity, whether they had been segregating with the disorder or not segregating with the disorder. Next, we'll go for the allelic data set that is has to deal with the compound heterozygous state of the variant. So as, you, as we have already been discussed about the compound heterozygous variant, so if the compound heterozygous variant is present in a trans state, it is causing a disease. And if it is present in the cis state, it won't cause a disease. Let's see how it will take place. Suppose, <clears throat> suppose uh, uh, this copy of the DNA in which the compound heterozygous is in cis uh, and has been inherited to the child, while from here it has been inherited from mother to the child. So both the pathogenic variants are present on the same copy of the gene due to which the particular uh, function of this protein won't be taking place. Why? As we know that in autosomal recessive mode of inheritance, uh, both the copies should not work. While the second copy does not have any of the mutation or the pathogenic mutation, which can perturb the function of this particular protein. Due to which this particular protein will compensate the uh, effect and won't get affected and the person will remain healthy. So both of these mutations will be considered as cis and won't be responsible for causing a disease. Let's take a different example in which the compound heterozygous are in trans that is present on two different copies of the gene. Since uh, because of the B variant, this particular copy is not being able to make the protein and protein will remain dysfunctional. Similarly for the second copy also, because of this pathogenic variant, this particular uh, copy is not uh, uh, able to make the protein functional and the person will be deceased and you can mark both the disorder both the uh, variant as a pathogenic mutation so in this way we can uh, see with the help of the compound heterozygous if they are in trans they are responsible for the disorder otherwise they are not so next uh, after the allelic data set we will look for the disease association studies that is genome wide association studies in the genome wide association studies, uh, we take the two types of cohort that is a control cohort and a disease cohort. And we perform the sequencing. It could be SNP based microarray in which we identify the control specific SNPs and that from the disease cohort, we take the disease specific SNPs and compare the SNPs uh, to discover what type of SNPs are associated with the disorder. Okay, so we will look at uh, the variant frequency which is much higher in the cases that is in the disease individual in comparison to the control. So as you can see it in there, there's a one variant whose RSID is 1234 has very high frequency in the cases in comparison to the controls. So we can say that this particular variant is responsible for the disease. And this way we can interpret our variant <clears throat> with the help of the G1 studies. So next, uh, uh, we can, uh, this much has been done for all the, uh, we have talked about all the population data set, computational method, this is how it's an overview. But for any of the variant uh, has to go through each and every data set one by one. After going through each and every data set, uh, it will satisfy some of the guidelines. It won't be able to satisfy on the guideline. So from the population data set, support is has satisfied PM2. So we'll mark for that particular variant as the PM2. From the well annotated, it has satisfied uh, the guidelines of a PM1. So we'll mark the PM1. From functional methods, it satisfied BS3. So we mark BS3. Disease association, it is PS4. And combining all these, all four of these uh, attributes, we'll put in the genetic variant interpretation tool, which was provided by the University of Medicine, Uni uh, University of Maryland, uh, Maryland, from the School of Medicine. And this interpretation tool will add up all the scoring system and will interpret or classify the variant into the pathogenic. 
depending on the scoring system it can be classified into any of those five categories okay and this tool is freely available at uh, this particular link you can go and check it out okay so this much for the uh, this session seven in the next session uh, we will be going to talk in much more detail about the uh, literature screening and uh, about all the attributes in much more details with the example so that we will do in the uh, tomorrow so for today uh, thanks for listening